When we begin to learn a Tanakh book, the first thing that we have to do is try to understand its overall structure, its themes, its broad strokes, its trajectory. Today, I want to, st I want to speak about the broad strokes of the books of Yoshua and Bimidbar. And I'm going to begin with Yoshua, but we're going to spend the bulk of this class talking about Bimidbar because that will really affect our understanding of the book of Yoshua. The book of Yoshua is the story of one generation, a generation that appears to be particularly free of sin. This really leads us to ask the question, why is this generation so different than others in Tanakh? Why is it so remarkably free of sins? One reason, of course, may be pragmatic. I mean, this is a busy time. They're busy conquering the land. But also, and perhaps more importantly, the relative righteousness of the generation that we're going to encounter in the book of Yoshua relates to the experiences of this generation. This is the generation that is born and bred and raised in the desert. This is a generation that knows only dependence upon God. To understand the people of the book of Yoshua, their exceptional nature, their strengths, but also their weaknesses, we have to look at the book of Bimidbar, because Bimidbar tells the story of two different generations who prepare to enter the land of Israel. The first generation, the freed slaves who left Egypt, they fail, they sin, and they are disqualified from entering the land. Following the disqualification of the generation who left Egypt, the nation of Israel spends 38 years in the desert allowing the first generation to die out and the second generation to grow up and prepare their own entrance into the land of Israel. And so Bamidbar tells the story of two separate generations, each of whom think that they are going to enter the land of Israel, each of whom engage in extensive preparations to enter the land. If you look at the structure of Bamidbar, you see pretty clearly the demarcation between these two generations, the failed one and the one that does enter the land. The first 19 chapters of the book of Bamidbar tell the story of the first generation, those who left Egypt. The first section of this book takes place in the second year after they leave Egypt, after the Exodus. And these are the first 10 chapters of the book, which describe the organization of the camp, the preparations for traveling through the desert, where they are intending to go directly into the land of Israel. And particularly these 10 chapters prepare them militarily for the upcoming war to conquer the land from the Canaanites. In Perak Aleph of Sefer Bamidbar, there is a census of the men eligible for military service. Kol Yotze Tzava is the refrain that we hear over and over during the course of this census. Now, what we see also later on in the, in the next few chapters is that there is a separate census of the Levim. The Levim, of course, do not go, go to war. They are instead drafted into service in the Mishkan. And during the course of this census, we're told that the Levi'im are counted according to kol habala tzava, everyone who comes tzava to the, to the army. But what kind of tzava? La'asot milacha be'ohel mo'ed. To do the service in the Mishkan. That is the army service of the Levi'im. And that's why we have a separate census of the Levi'im. Now, in the same section at the beginning of Sefer Bimidbar, the nation appoints and names the leaders of each tribe, right, that we have in Perak Aleph, we have it again in Perak Yud, um, according to several of the Mefarshim. This is the military leadership. Each tribe gets its own aloof, its own military leader. Um, in general, the, the, the whole section, all 10 chapters at the beginning of Sefer Bimidbar, prepare the nation militarily 
to conquer the land, to enter the land, to conquer the land. And one thing that I think we also have to note is that this initial section in the Book of Bamidbar, it's very harmonious, right? It's really marked by a sense of serenity. Obedience to God is a primary component of their travels and their movement toward the land of Israel. So that in Bamidbar, Perak Tet, in the ninth chapter, we're told, Al pi Hashem yachanu ve'al pi Hashem Yisau et mishmeret Hashem shamaru al pi Hashem biyad Moshe. So they're doing everything according to God. They're camping in accordance with God's instructions. They're traveling in accordance with God's instructions. They are simply completely obedient to God's instructions that are given over by Moshe. This is a very harmonious description of the way in which the nation, the first generation that leaves Egypt at the beginning of Sefer Bamidbar, act in accordance with God's instructions and in accordance with the way in which Moshe gives them those instructions. Now, at the end of this section, in chapter 10, what we see is, is that the camp of, of Israel is beginning to travel. They're moving towards the land. Ele Mas'e Vene Israel Litsivotam. These are the travels. They're beginning to travel. And at the very conclusion of chapter 10, this section of Sefer Bemidbar closes by focusing on the Aron, on the Ark, the vessel in the Mishkan that symbolizes God's presence. And what we're told in that almost final pasuk at the end of chapter 10 is that the Aron travels at the front of the people, at the vanguard of, uh, of the army. And Moshe declares with assurance that God will vanquish the enemy. Vayhi bin soa ha'aron, vayomer Moshe, and it was when the ark traveled, Moshe said, kuma Hashem v'yafutsu oivecha v'yanusu misanecha mipanecha. Get up, God, and scatter the enemies. Let the enemies run away from before you. And there's a sense of confidence. The freed slaves who have just left Egypt seem to be on the cusp of entrance into the land. They are poised to conquer it with confidence and with God's assistance. And so this initial section of the Book of Bamidbar, it's a great section. It's very harmonious. It gives us the sense that this first generation is about to enter the land of Israel. This whole section lacks tension it lacks fear, it lacks any kind of complaint, <clears throat> and it really concludes with a sense of optimism and even serenity uh, fostered by what appears to be abiding trust in God's goodness and the good that they are about to receive. And this is conveyed by a word that is repeated several times towards the end of this initial section in Sefer Bamidbar, chapter 10, and the repeated word is the word Tov, where we have Moshe trying to convince Chovav ben Reuel to join Am Yisrael in this good and beneficial journey to the land. So Moshe says to Chovav, Nosim anachnu el hamakom asher amar Hashem. We are going to that place which God told us about, and God told us, Oto eten lachem, I'm going to give you this place. Lechaitanu, come with us. And we will bring you good. Because God spoke good about Yisrael. And if you come with us, you see that? The word tov there appears five times. All of that good that God is doing for us will also happen to you, will also be transferred over to you. And so, you know, what we have in this initial section in Sefer Bamidbar is a sense that this second generation is going to enter the land. It's all going to be good. It's all harmonious. Obedience to God is the, is, is the way that everybody seems to be experiencing these travels. And had everything continued in this vein, what I think we're meant to sense is, is that Bamidbar Perak Yud, the 10th chapter of Bamidbar, should have kind of seamlessly moved us into the book of Yoshua into entrance into the land. Actually, when we look in Yoshua, in the third chapter of Sefer Yoshua, the very same phrase appears that appeared at the end of this initial section of the book of Bamidbar, and that is the phrase, Vayhi bin Soa. 
right? So at the end of this section of the Book of Bamidbar, we have the sense that they're immediately traveling into the land with the, the, the Aron at the head of this army of, um, of, of, uh, of the nation of Israel. And in Yoshua, Paragimel, that same phrase appears as they're entering the land. Vahi bin soa ha'am me'ohalehem. These are the only two places in the Tanakh where we have this phrase, vahi bin soa. And it suggests that the direct continuation of Bimidbar, Perak Yud, should have been what takes place ultimately in Yehoshua. Perak Gimel, in the third chapter of Yoshua. This story should have continued, perhaps it would have continued, with the conquest of the first city, with the conquest of Yericho, where the Aron plays such a prominent role at the forefront of the battle, God's battle, right? The Aron takes them around the city. That should have been what took place immediately following Bimidbar, chapter 10. If at the end of the first section we see the word tov appearing over and over and over at the beginning of Perakir Aleph, just a few psukim later, everything has turned bad. And that's marked by the appearance of the word ra, which is of course the opposite of tov. Tov is good, ra is bad. At the beginning of chapter 11, we see the word ra appear over and over. Vahi ha'am kimit onanim ra Hashem. The people were complaining. This was bad in the ears of God. We have in Pasuk Yud, Vayishma Moshe Ta'am, Bochel Mishpechotav, Vayichar Af Hashem Eod, Uveine Moshe, Ra. Right? The, Moshe hears the people crying, and in his eyes, this is bad. And Moshe turns to God and says in Pasuk Yud Af, Lama Hareota. Le'avdecha, why have you done bad to your servant? And again in Pasuk Tedvav, ve'al er'e bira'ati. I do not want to see my, the, the bad that has happened to me. How does the tov turn to ra? I mean, within just a few psukim. And, and, and why doesn't this nation enter the land? What happens to them that that incredibly harmonious depiction of the first section immediately deteriorate, deteriorates and disintegrates and turns the tov, the good situation, into bad. Well, the question is complicated, but I'm going to venture a simple answer. It seems that the first generation is unwilling, perhaps even unable, to depend upon God for their existence, not for food and not for military success. The people complain they recall their rations as slaves in Egypt with longing. They express a preference for that sort of lifestyle, the lifestyle of slaves who receive their daily rations, rather than one in which they receive miraculous man in the desert. Right? What do the people say? Zacharnu et hadaga asher nochal b'mitzrayim chinam et hakishuim ve'et avatichim ve'et hachatzir ve'et habetzalim. Right? So we have here this whole description of all of the food that they ate in Egypt. And Rashi is amazed by the word chinam. Chinam? You ate this food for free in Egypt? But Rashi explains chinam min hamitzvot. We ate this food free of the commandments, free of the dependence upon God for our success, for our sustenance. It seems that they prefer to be slaves who receive a daily allotment of food rather than to be dependent upon an amorphous God for their sustenance. And the same holds true for in terms of conquest of the land. They make a military assessment in the story of the spies, and they conclude that they are unable to conquer the land militarily. And that may be true if there is no divine assistance. But what we see here is that they are unwilling to depend upon God to achieve this conquest, right? What do the people say? What do the spies say? Lo nuchal alot el ha'am ki chazak hu mimenu. Right? We can't possibly go up and conquer those Canaanites because they're stronger than us. And they may be stronger. That may be a true military assessment. But they are meant to depend upon God that he will fight on their behalf and that he will ensure their military success. And this is why the first generation, the generation of those who left Egypt, 
cannot enter the land. Success in the land of Israel rests upon the nation's ability and their willingness to depend upon God. Life in Israel depends upon Israel's recognition that their relationship with God will determine their success in the land, both economically and militarily. And so the book of Bimibar recognizes the failure of the first generation. It cannot enter the land. It refuses to cultivate the sort of relationship with God that will entail their success living in the land of Israel. And so the book of Bimibar moves on to the second generation. Uh, chapter 19, Perak Yudtet, describes the process of purifying from contact with the dead, the para aduma mitzvah, right? The mitzvah, the commandment in which we uh, purify from contact with the dead, which may allude to that sort of bridge between the death of the first generation um, and the, the, the movement to the next generation. Already in chapter 20, we move on to the 40th year. We encounter a new generation and their preparations to enter the land. Chapters 20 through 36 describe this preparation of the second generation. And like the first generation, they, they, they engage in some very similar kinds of preparations. That shouldn't surprise us. Of course, both of the generations at different points in the book are preparing for entering the land. And during the course of these chapters, the second generation also takes a census of the adult males. Uh, it also engages in a separate census between the tribe of Levi and the other tribes. And in this section as well, the nation appoints and names the leaders of each tribe. However, there is a major difference in the manner in which the second generation prepares to enter the land um, and the manner in which the first generation did so. Although the phrase kol yotzei tzava appears at the opening of the census in chapter 26, it doesn't appear again. The census of the second generation is not primarily military in nature. Instead, the psukim tell us very explicitly, the census is taken not to prepare for war, but to prepare for settlement, for nachala to determine which tribe is bigger and which tribe is smaller in allotting them a portion of the land. And if you look in Bimidbar, Perak Kavav, at the end of the Perak, you see very clearly what the purpose of the census was for. La'ele techalek ha'aretz binachala. To these, you will divide the land according to his portions, according to the size of the tribe that has been discovered in this census. La rav tarbe nachalato, to the bigger tribes, you give them a bigger settlement. Vilam at tamit nachalato, and to the smaller tribes, you give them a smaller settlement. Al pi hagoral techalek nachalato, the census is about dividing up the different portions of land for the purpose of settlement. This is not a military census primarily. And the same is true about the separate counting of the Levi'im. While previously it was clear that the Levi'im were counted separately because they do not go out to battle, their service is in the Mishkan, here, the Pasuk tells us very explicitly in Perak Kavav in chapter 26, verse 62, that they do not go, that they are not being counted here because they do not receive a portion in the land. Ki lo hotpakdu betoch b'nei Yisrael, ki lo nitan lahem nachala betoch b'nei Yisrael. They are not counted among b'nei Yisrael because they do not get a portion of the land. And so it's a very different reason than the, the, the initial reason, the, the reason that the first generation counts the Levim separately. Here it's not because the Levim don't go out to war, it's because the Levim don't get a portion in the land. They don't get a nachala. And the same, by the way, is true in terms of the difference that we see with regard to the appointment of leaders. While previously the tribal leaders were appointed, al tziva 
mate b'nei Reuven, b'nei Shimon. The, the, the previous leaders were appointed to be military leaders. Here, it, it's pretty clear that the tribal leaders are appointed to assist in the act of apportioning the areas for settlement. We have in Bemidbar, in chapter 34, in Paraglam Adalid, Eile Shemot Ha'anashim, Asher Yin Chalulachem These are the names of the tribal leaders who will help you to inherit the land, to possess the land, to settle the land. And what follows is Nasi Echad, Nasi Echad Mimate, right? One leader from each tribe, Tikhu Linchol Et Haaretz. You take in order to help the people settle the land. And of course, each one is named just like we had in the first section. So what transpires from all of this is that there is a major difference between the preparations of the first generation, the generation that exited Egypt, and the second generation, the generation that grew up in the desert. The generation of the desert does not need to prepare itself militarily. After all, they've grown up in the desert. They are completely confident as to God's ability and willingness to protect them, to fight on their behalf. The second generation has a different need. They need to prepare for the stage after the conquest, for the stage that will follow the conquest of the land, namely the settlement of the land. When each tribe goes to its allotted area and begins to build their houses and plant their orchards and their vineyards and take possession of their inheritances. Once we understand this, we can understand the strengths and the weaknesses of this second generation, the one that grew up in the desert, the generation that will enter the land. This generation grew up receiving a miraculous portion of food every day. They have an innate ability to utterly depend on God, to feel totally confident in God. They do not need to prepare for battles because they know Hashem ilachem lachem ve'atem tacharishun. They know that which the first generation did not know. God will fight on your behalf and you will remain silent. They know that the Aron will go before them and vanquish their enemies. But this utter dependence upon God that is experienced by this second generation, it has a downside as well. It, will this generation of the desert be able and willing to detach themselves from the camp, from the Mishkan, from the Aron, from the, the place of God's presence? Will they be able to forge out on their own and settle the land? The problem of the first generation is that they're hesitant to depend upon God. They are skeptical about God's presence among them. Their motto is, Hayesh Hashem Bekirbeinu Im Ain. Is God in our midst or is He not? The problem of the second generation is perhaps that they're inclined to be too dependent upon God. Their motto is, Halo Hashem Bekirbeinu. Lo tavo aleinu ra'ah. God is in our midst. And when he is, nothing bad can happen to us. Therefore, it's very hard for them to settle the land. They have to prepare themselves for nachala, for settlement, for independence, for forging out on their own. By looking carefully at the way Bimidbar describes the different generations, preparing to enter the land, we see the weaknesses of each generation. The weakness of the first generation disqualifies them from entering the land. The second generation, who are able to depend upon God, they can enter the land, but they have to be vigilant about attending to their inclination to be overly dependent upon God's presence and not adequately fulfill their task of settling the land. In fact, once we understand this second generation, we can really understand the book of Yoshua, its broad strokes, its trajectory, its successes and failures. The first 12 chapters of the book describe 
the entrance into the land of Israel, of this generation of the desert, of this second generation, and the conquest. And unsurprisingly, as we would expect, knowing Sefer Bimidbar, these chapters are fairly smooth. There are almost no problems. There's almost no tension. However, beginning in Yehoshua, chapter 13, the process of settling the land begins. The conquest is largely completed and the people are meant to go, each tribe, to their allotted portion in order to settle the land. This goes less smoothly, as we would expect. The repercussions of the failure of the second half of Sefer Yehoshua, the failure to properly conquer the land, echo throughout the second half of the book of Yehoshua in Parak Yud Gimel, and again we see it in Parak Yud Chet, and we see it throughout the, book of Yo, the, the second half of the book of Yehoshua, and it continues through to the book of Judges, to Sefer Shoftim, where that failure to settle the land lays the groundwork for the book of Judges, its failure in its attempt to set up a thriving society. So in today's shiur, we've explored some broad themes in both Bimidbar and in Yoshua, and an analysis of these books has helped us to understand the different natures of two seminal generations, their strengths and their weaknesses. The generation of Yitzhak Yitzrayim, the generation of the Exodus that was disqualified from entering the land of Israel because of their failure to depend upon God. And we also saw the generation of the desert, which is also the generation of the book of Yoshua, who successfully conquered the, the land of Israel in the book of Yoshua, are able to depend upon God, but have a difficult time with autonomy, a difficult time with independence.